Midtown Studios of Bloomberg Television in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. The O.J. Simpson trial riveted the nation and divided it along racial lines in many cases. At the center of the controversy stood defense attorney Johnny Cochran. The trial lawyer and former prosecutor has made a career out of attacking police misconduct and defending and suing people on that issue. No stranger to the spotlight, his high-profile clients include Michael Jackson and Jim Brown. Journey to Justice is his rise to the helm of Simpson's so-called dream team and the climb that preceded it. And I'm very pleased to have him on this broadcast. Welcome. Thank you very much, Charlie. It's great to have you here. Shreveport, uh, Charity Hospital. How many years ago? About 50 years ago? Well, a little more than that. Maybe 59 years ago. 59? 59 years yeah. ago, yes. Um, your dad was Johnny Cochran Sr. That's right. He lives with you now in Los Angeles. He's seen this sort of evolution. He does, and he's a great inspiration to me. Tell me about growing up in Louisiana before you moved to Los Angeles. I have the greatest memories of it. A family, uh, so much love. Um, I knew nothing about segregation, knew nothing about prejudice or um, any kind of racial dilemmas or whatever. Just a time of love and family, eating together. Um, you just could be whatever you wanted to be. And I, I remember early on, my parents stressing education, the need for education being the key. It was just great. I remember the Sundays, we sat down, we ate together, we walked you know, to church uh, every Sunday. It was a great, great time. How many brothers and sisters? I had at that time two sisters. I'd have, I have two sisters and one brother. Yeah. And they, where are they? Uh, they're all in Los Angeles. We all yeah. stayed very You all come when the family moved to L.A., all stayed there. Yeah, we all stayed there and we've always done that. Your mother was Hattie? Hattie Cochran, yeah, yes. She deceased? Just died in October of 1991, almost five years now. Yeah. So she saw Johnny become the lawyer that he wanted to be. Well, yes, she did. And I, and I feel she's still very much with me now. I mean, on all the days I, I think about it. Religion is important. I mean, is part of you deep inside? Very much part of me. It guides everything I do. I believe very strongly that in all that ways acknowledge him, and he will direct my path. You moved to L.A., and your dad by then, what, was an insurance? Yes, he was with the Salesman. Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, yeah. yes. You yeah. went to L.A. High. I did. I did. I loved it. It was a great yeah. school. Great yeah. school. Dustin Hoffman, a friend? One of my classmates, yes. Yes, yeah. it was an exciting time for me. When did you say lawyer, being in the legal system, prosecutor, defense attorney, judge? Well, I actually started that, uh, the thought in junior high school. I remember a conversation with my parents. My mother wanted me to be a doctor. My father said, well, you know, if he wants to be a lawyer, let him be there. But she said, then promise me you'll be the best that you can be. From that moment on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I, I've kept that, uh, that dream alive, actually. And so by the time I got to high school, it was, it, was a, it was great because I was in a great area where I could compete with kids. And um, from that point on, it's, it's been what I wanted to do. If you're a young black man growing up in Los Angeles or growing up anywhere in America in the 50s, people like Thurgood Marshall, yes. uh, giants. I mean, nobody stood taller than Thurgood Marshall when he argued Brown versus Board of Education. Absolutely. He became my absolute legal mentor. I mean, what he did in Brown versus the Board of Education was remarkable. And I thought, gee, I could do this and try to change society and change it for the better. I thought it was remarkable. Yeah. After you went to law school where? Uh, in Los Angeles, Loyola Law School in Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah. There's a story that you wanted to go to Harvard and Dad said, I got some other kids to educate beside you. He did. And my sisters especially at that time. And yes, and so I understood. I had that dream, but I went on and uh, went to UCLA undergrad and went on to Loyola Law School. City attorney? Yes, a young prosecutor started off the first two and a half years. It was exciting. Yeah. And then went out in private practice? Yeah, went to private practice after about uh, two and a half years there in the city attorney's office. And I was in private practice for almost 11 years. Where did this sense of involvement with police misconduct, which had shaped your life, become central? It really stemmed from the time in the city attorney's office. In California, Charlie, we have something called uh, 148 of the Penal Code, which is a, a charge that's resisting, interfering, delaying, obstructing an officer in the performance of his duty. As a young prosecutor, I'd see these defendants uh, come in, and many times they, they still showed the effects of injuries they'd suffered. And invariably, they were charged with the offense involving the officer. The officer seemed no problem, no worse than the wear. No bruises. So, no bruises at all. But yet we were prosecuting these guys for misdemeanor charges. And after a period of time, it became very emotional for everyone. Most of these people were African-Americans. Many times the police officers were white. 
for over a period of time, it came to, to me to seem that, gee, we're doing this to keep these, these defendants from suing the city of Los Angeles. It seems like I was part of a conspiracy there, and the, the reports all said the same. This person was resisting and interfering. And we had a saying that the, these are gentlemen or people who had flunked the attitude test because, you know, mere words can be resisting yeah. and interfering. Cop pulls them over, their attitude is not just right, something happens. It escalates and they, they end up getting assaulted. Why do you think that happens? I think it has to do with race and racism. You know, whether we like it or not, racism has played a part in our lives uh, in this country. Now, yeah, I love this country. Uh, it's the greatest country in the world. But it doesn't help uh, to pretend that we don't have some problems. They, they got better. Uh, but we have to keep working at it, and, and I saw that pretty clearly. I thought it was an issue of race. I really did. And it comes from just the life that the, the community that people are living in. It comes from wherever racism flows out of. Oh, I think so. It has a lot to do with the history of the Los Angeles Police Department. We talk about that in Journey to Justice. Many of these police officers were recruited by Chief Parker, a very strong chief, William he, Parker. William Parker, a legend in, in his time. He really was. Jack Webb made him made him very famous. famous. He went to the southern states to recruit uh, tough people from the south who came there. And they were almost like an occupying force. We didn't have community-based police. These police officers lived, many of them, outside the city of L.A. They would come in and, you know, uh, patrol and uh, supposedly protect and serve in areas they never lived in. It made a difference. They didn't know these people. They came with all the biases and stereotypical thinking. And it was a real problem. And, you know, uh, what I saw starting there as a young prosecutor in 63 to about 65, of course, culminated in August of 1965, what was known then as the Watts Riots. I mean, you could really see it coming. There were so many of these cases. It always, the trigger was always uh, a police officer stops a citizen and it always escalates. And that was the problem. But Los Angeles has also had a very popular black mayor who had been a policeman. He really was. But think about it. Tom Bradley was wonderful. He meant so much to our city. You see the skyline today, and he's one of my mentors also. But he was a police officer. It was so bad and so tough on him, as bright as he was, he could only go to the rank of lieutenant. So what did he do? He left the department, he became a lawyer, he uh, ran for the city council, and ultimately became mayor. So yeah. he was over the chief. But the chief was very strong. Parker was gone by now. But Parker's driver, the succession of chiefs, uh, Redden, Davis, and some others, was now Daryl Gates, yeah. who had learned at the foot of, 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 uh, Bill, Parker. of Bill, Parker. Bill Parker. Yes. Yeah. Geronimo Pratt. Yes. What did that mean to you? That case uh, taught me um, a lot of things, Charlie. It taught me, among other things, to never accept the official version at face value. This is an innocent man, convicted of a murder that he didn't commit. He's a man who is a victim of the FBI's counterintelligence program. As a naive young lawyer in 1972, I had won like 10 murder cases in a row. I didn't think that I was going to lose. I thought this was another case. The prosecutor on the other side was in my law school class at Loyola. I thought I could trust these people. This was going to be fair, a fair fight. I didn't know that he was a uh, target or a victim of the counterintelligence program. But they really used perjured te testimony. A key yeah. witness was asked, are you an informant? Have you ever been an informant for the FBI or any other agency? He said no. The prosecutor knew that he had been an informant. In fact, at that time, through the records we found out afterwards, he'd informed 33 times for the FBI. Now, of course, we know he's an informant for the L.A. County DA's office, the L.A. Uh, Police Department, and the FBI. Yet they continue to stonewall a man who's been in jail then. Uh, from 72 until now, and actually he, started, he was in jail since 1970. So 26 years for a crime he didn't commit, and I've said that that one case uh, will not let me retire from practice until he's free. I don't understand whatever the city is, how good cops allow bad cops to do this. Do they sit by? Do they know? Is the system so built so that if, in fact, you try to stop it, you're consumed by that? It's a very tough, it's a, it's a real tough issue. Just uh, recently in New York, you've had a situation where a police officer was involved with the death of a young man, where the judge acquitted the police officer and it caused some furor. One of the people who testified against that police officer has had to be transferred because of harassment and fear for her safety. There is really this kind of thin blue line, a really a siege mentality where it's us against them. Now, police officer, police, police work is very tough, Charlie. Then you put your life on the line. Put your life on the line every day. And yeah. too many mayors have been to too many funerals of too many good cops. Absolutely. So they, they tend to stick together. That's how a Mark Furman could exist for 20 years. People knew about him. Nobody's gonna, nobody calls him on it. 
That's how he flourishes. And so he gets to retirement day in this kind of situation. And he's not all the police. Now, make no mistake about it. There are a number of good police, but they tend to look the other way. Uh, the good guy, bad guy. Uh, the good guy doesn't say anything about it. Bad guy goes on and does what he has to do. Back to your career. You're driving down the highway with your family. You're in your brown Rolls <laughs> Royce. You are known, prosecutor, yes. successful, admired. You're pulled over. What happened? I'm the assistant district attorney for Los Angeles County. It's 1978, 1979. Uh, I'm doing what I love doing. I've gone back from private practice now. I, I hear the officers give commands. Get out of the car and put your hands over your head. I get out of the car and I look back and it's amazing. There are police cars in the... Not one, but three. Oh, there's three police cars. There's officers behind doors, barricaded. Their guns are out and they're pointed toward me. Now, I know from my experience, you never do your fighting or arguing in the street. I then step over to the curb. I'm concerned because my children, my two youngest children are in the car. They start to cry when they see this happening to their dad. Officer walks with his gun in hand and I say to him, put that gun away, my children are in that car. So the children see this gun, he comes inside, I carry a bag, the officer goes inside the bag, opens my bag. Use your has, wallet and stuff. Yeah, he has no probable cause of this, but he goes inside this bag and he sees my badge. And then he's waving off and everything because it has a badge in there saying, assistant DA number three. Uh, I said, no, no, get your sergeant out here. We gotta talk about why this happened. They give me an excuse that, gee, you know, we thought this car might be stolen in this area. And I said, wait a minute, see those license plates there? JCJR, they've been with this car for as long as I've had it. I've the car before. I said, you know, you stopped me because I was an African-American. That's not right. Uh, you had no reason. Well, you know, no, no, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. No, they didn't admit it, but that was clearly the reason. There was, we were going 30 miles an hour. It was a Saturday afternoon, a bright, sunny day on Sunset Boulevard. I'll never forget that because I then was faced with the situation, Charlie, trying to explain to my daughter, Tiffany, who's now a newscaster. Uh, Florence, oh, South Carolina, Florence, South Carolina still? Yes, absolutely. Why her daddy was stopped. She said, she said to me, Daddy, aren't you on the same side as the police? I said, yes, honey, I am. And I remember how we were insulated by our folks. I did the best I could to understand that there were good police officers, make her understand, there were good police officers and bad police officers. And sometimes people did things. Uh, it was difficult, though. As a prosecutor, did you ever put a policeman on the stand who you knew might not be, might not be retelling the story exactly the way it happened in order to get a conviction? Oh, I think so. I think that was one of the things. And if you look I mean, at didn't that bother you? I mean, there's a defendant there you're convicting, perhaps. Troubled me no end. In fact, the reports are written so well. They always said the same thing. You know, when they're just drunk driving arrest. But there you were part of the same system, and you were putting guys on you know is exactly. close to perjury. Exactly. So you... Exactly. So you know what I did? What? I went to my superiors, and I said, we talk about this in the book, in a chapter called A Soul Divided. Right. Right. I said, I'm not going to prosecute these cases anymore, especially 148s, where I believe the police officers are fabricating these stories. So I become part of the conspiracy to keep these people from suing the city of Los Angeles. And that's what I say to prosecutors. I mean, the job doesn't mean anything if you don't try to stand for something. So I stopped doing that, and they respected that. What do you think will change it? Oh, I think you got to have good people in the system, people who, it's not just a job. you got to have police officers who live and work in the community. Do you believe that the L.A. Police Department that stopped you in your Rolls Royce that day in front of your children are any different than the police department in Los Angeles today? Oh, I think it's a little better today. I think since we have Chief Willie Williams, um, I have my differences with some of the things Chief Willie Williams done. was there when O.J. Simpson... Yes, and I have my differences about some of the things he's done, but I think that the attitude is probably a little bit better now than it was at that time. Uh, in those days, we had Chief Parker, I mean Chief Gates, uh, the reincarnation of Parker right. in some regards. And, and although Darrell Gates is a very engaging and charming fellow, he had many of those same policies, and he, he made so many unfortunate public pronouncements. Other than religion and family and race, nothing has in, influenced you more in the battle against what you characterize as police misconduct. Yes. Nothing. Yes. That's been a real battle all of my life. Because you know why, Charlie? I realized early on that that first traffic ticket that I tried, the police officer in the street is the single most powerful figure in the criminal justice system. He could take your life, yeah. he can abuse you, he can, he can maim you, and they always, they're going to take his word. There's one problem with this, though, because when you say it, not you, but when anybody says it, and it is so central, it is the fact of so many good, hard-working policemen and women who get up every morning 
in a job that they don't make that much money and risk their life for our safety. You know, and they're tarred really is it? with this sense of you guys are on the take. You guys are corrupt. You guys beat up on minorities. It's a real problem. One thing about the LAPD, we don't it's unfair really, to them. It is unfair to the, to the good uh, officers, and most of them are good officers. Here's the problem with it. Um, first of all, in L.A., we don't have many officers on the take. We don't have much corruption there. What we do have, however, is, is more brutality than we should. There is a hardcore group of officers, and they now know. They were identified in the Christopher Commission report and the Webster report. These hardcore officers who keep having complaints, who keep beating up people. The problem with the good officers, and certainly there are many more of them, is they shouldn't stand idly by. These are paramilitary organizations. If the head of the department says... Paramilitary organization? Yes, I mean, they follow orders. I mean, the LAPD, oh, you mean in terms of the whole police they, department? They have is the it? structure, right, right. right. Police officers follow orders. If the, if, you, if the chief says, we're not going to tolerate an officer abusing someone, and if you are there and you see this, or you countenance this, you're going to be in trouble also. And internal affairs really meant what it's supposed to be internal affairs, where they had some teeth in it, where they weren't worried about... Uh, uh, things like conduct on becoming an officer, where you go out and you accidentally pick up somebody who's a drag queen or something, you get fired for that. But go out and beat somebody up or shoot somebody, whatever, it's, it's real, it's a different story. So we need the good officers to stand up and to speak out. That's what clear, clears the house. And you cannot then, they should be subjected to harassment from, the top, from Serpico to this lady here in New York who blew the whistle on this particular officer. You've got to have officers who stand up. When you got the call, when you heard that O.J. Simpson uh, had been had been a murder, and O.J. Simpson was being questioned. Did you first think what? What did you think? I just, first? Uh, my heart went out. I, I knew O.J. Simpson. Friend? Uh, uh, yeah, friend. Acquaintance, acquaintance not, not friend. Acquaintance, acquaintance friend. Uh, somebody I didn't see very often, but I'd seen before. Right. Two years before, I'd seen him at a, um, uh, his daughter had graduated, and I was back at the graduation, went to a party, had a party along with him. I talk about this in the book. Somebody that I, that I had respect for growing up in, around Los Angeles. I felt my heart went out. His ex-wife, thought about those children, but I didn't think much else about it except the Was you, your first instinct, O.J. Simpson could not kill someone? Oh, yeah, that was my sense. That was always my sense. I didn't think of him as a suspect at all. My, my, I felt so terrible for the children and, you know, for him and the loss. That was my initial thoughts, right? But did you know anything about all these other incidents involving him that had come to light in, during the trial and leading up to the trial and during the trial? No, I didn't. It was I, not part of your knowledge? No, not it wasn't part, part of, of my knowledge. No, no, it wasn't None any of it. common knowledge. There may have been an article regarding the January 1st, 1989 right, right. incident, but I don't recall that at the time, no. Jeffrey Tubin, as you know, in his book. Have you read these books, no. these other books? No, I was busy writing my own. I know no, I did not, but it's been, it, it, I know much of what's said because yeah, I'm asked questions all no, the time. No, and the question that everybody asks out of the two book is one of them, and each of these books have a sort of flashpoint in which sure. the question, one, sure. the question about you is, sure. did you say to anybody at any time before you took the case, he's guilty? Absolutely not. Absolutely not once, not, not anybody, not nobody, ever. anybody who stepped forward to say, Cochran yeah. said that is a lie. That's exactly correct, and you won't find anybody who'll step forward. Why would Tubin write it? You know, it, it's amazing why Jeffrey does things like this. I know Jeffrey Tubin from court. Let me, let me answer this. He's a distinguished reporter. He's a, he is a distinguished reporter, but he never heard me say it. I've talked to him many, many occasions. He says some, he has a source who somebody told him, let me tell you why it's a lie. Jeffrey Tubin says that on June 17th, I told somebody that G.O.J. Simpson's in denial, should go along, and then maybe he'll, uh, he should plead to a lesser charge or diminished capacity. On June 17th, I was working as a commentator. Uh, and I was going around, I was speaking, uh, that evening I was engaged to go to, on Nightline. Right. I didn't know anything really about the case. I didn't have any reports. O.J. Simpson had never even called me. He says also in the book that I, I had inside information. I didn't know anything. I first saw police reports in this case after I entered into July 22nd of 1994. You I hadn't nothing. seen anything. I hadn't didn't seen know anything. anything. Didn't know anything. O.J. Simpson had called me from the jail. And to keep the press from, from making a big... Um, a hubbub. I never went down to the jail. We talked over the phone. You and, and Simpson. They, me and Simpson. And then I talked also with Shapiro. Never went to the jail because I knew if I went down there, it would cause all these rumors. Never saw any reports until after I appeared in court on Friday, July 22nd. So you had, absolutely while wrong. you were sitting around the Nightline studio waiting to go on Nightline, you didn't say to anybody anything that could have been misinterpreted as a 
he's guilty and he ought to do this or he ought to do that. Absolutely not. I no didn't advice know for whoever the attorney might be. Yeah, I didn't know what the facts were. I didn't know. Yeah. No, I didn't do that. I was there just to answer questions and to, and to respond to the fact. In fact, that evening, I was concerned that I thought he was going to kill himself that evening until you know, it was resolved. Why would he kill himself? Because we, that's suicide note. There was a suicide note that they'd read early in the day yeah. in Kardashian and I think in Shapiro indicating that he said he was innocent but he just couldn't understand why all this was happening to him and it seemed as though this, 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 this so-called low speed chase just seemed like a horrible thing. So again, I was thinking that something bad might happen to this But this man. is a guy of amazing strength, isn't it? I mean, you oh. do what he did with his life oh, yeah. uh, to become the football star he did to succumb to suicide. It would be hard to understand, but he'd never been through this before. He was a man whose life had really been charmed. And, I mean, and, and they had a lot to lose. And he, did, and he seemed was, he was having a tough time. But that note just, was just based upon the note. I had no inside information. How do you explain Kadassian? Well, you know, I haven't seen the book yet. I, I saw only a tease on a program coming up um, later. You know what he and, said. And sorry, well, well, I mean, uh, you know. Something about having doubts or whatever. Right. I, I'm surprised. Uh, we always thought of him as a, as a very, very, very strong friend for O.J. Simpson. That's all he was the there every and day. He, and he never, he never, he said, he's, he renewed his bar license right. and became a lawyer. Uh, renewed his license. Uh, I'm, I'm really surprised. He never talked about having any doubts before this. And what I'm really surprised about, because by and large, um, he's a fellow that I have um, a great respect for, is the ethical violation. He is a lawyer. He cannot so he's violating the confidentiality of a relationship with a client to be saying that, even now, after absolutely. an acquittal? It's oh, a absolutely. violation? Does he have doubts about it? Oh, absolutely, because the client has the the client right. didn't release him from doing this. And he now puts himself in a position where the client is about to start have a civil trial. Is Kardashian now going to be called as a witness or whatever? This is I had doubts about it. I mean, he may even say more than that. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, we haven't seen the book. But I mean, that, that's the thing that's so hard to understand. So, so, so if he say, is saying that he could be held in contempt. Could be held in that. The state bar could do more than that. If he is barring? violating attorney, yes, the attorney-client privilege, that's how serious it is for a lawyer to do that. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with this case as most reporters who cover it because it was not my beat. It's not what I do, as you well know. I understand, sir. What was in that bag? And whatever happened to that bag? Which bag are you talking about? One that supposedly Kardashian had? Well, the bag that Kardashian had, and it'd be interesting to talk, for him to talk about this in the book, but the bag, the ultimate, we brought that bag to court. The bag I yeah. think that they're talking about yeah. remained in Kardashian's garage. They never, the police never came back. We then uh, arranged to have that bag picked up and brought to court. And they inspected that bag and went through, the, I'm sure, every possible lab. There's nothing in that bag. That's the bag that he had. Yeah. So he, he got, had himself a lot of speculation toward him based upon the bag. But the bag had nothing in it but clothes. Talk about some of the personalities in this case that you've sure. been through this routine before, too. Sure. Shapiro. Bob Shapiro did a good job in putting together the team. Something happened to him along the way. Did passing the baton to you bother him? Yes, it, that was the triggering mechanism because it wasn't a, a voluntary passing. It was January 2nd of 1995. O.J. Simpson said, I'm making a change. Uh, I want somebody else to head this team up. I need a trial lawyer. That, at the time, I didn't know. That was, that was difficult for Bob. Um, he, he offered to leave the team. Simpson was smart. Simpson says, look, I don't want him off this team. You'll cause more problems outside. So he stayed. And he was a team player. I mean, he, he, at that point, he stayed there. We didn't know how deeply the feelings went. And you know, early deeply on. Deeply the feelings went that Simpson was guilty. No, I mean, by deeply the feelings went about this change. I mean, the point. I oh, think oh, I see how much he, he did. That there was resentment, much more resentment than right. I realized at the time. You I think, think he believed Simpson? You suggest he believed Simpson was guilty? You know, early on, he never talked about that. Later on, we'd have these theories. He'd come up with this theory about that. Well, I got it. He went over there to key her car. And I remember slash her tires. I said, whatever. Wait a minute. She wasn't killed with the key. What are you talking about? Well, yeah. secure car, slash your tires. And so we'd hear these things, and I'd say, look, that's silly. The client has always maintained his innocence. So we'd have those kind of things. We started one meeting once when he was still in charge about how many here feel that O.J. Simpson is guilty? Let's take him away for it. All of you sitting around a table, yes, the dream yes, team. Yes, yes, yes. Supposedly, yes. And he, somebody, and so, somebody, he says that or you say that? No. He says that yeah. to start the meeting. Right. We're, we're aghast, you know. And all, the, all of us feel very strongly that the client is innocent. I mean, he, you see a Barry Sheck. Peter Newfell sitting around the table, but we can believe it. Uh, so those kind of things happen. Then there were other things you talk about him. He's, as I said, he put together some great witnesses, and, and then uh, Henry Lee, Michael Baden, people like that. Uh, the fact that Barry Sheck and Newfell are on the team, we owe that to him. But the day he cross-examined Van Adder, he comes to court wearing one of these LAPD kind of blue ribbons. Yeah. Van Adder is angry at him. Simpson is angry at him. We don't understand what he's doing. He makes friends, goes out of his way and makes friends with Turtle Law, who was then the lawyer Furman. And I'd say to him, I said, Bob, when this is over, you're going to be the one sued. And sure enough, he was sued for $50 million by them. None of us were, because we never said to Jeffrey Tubin in the New Yorker magazine about 
uh, permanent and planning. About race. Yeah. So he goes on. About um, planning. About yeah, business planning. conduct. And, and about Furman, right? And, and some of the, many other things, but the, probably the worst. Just, just the point is that Furman, uh, that, that it was uh, Shapiro that gave Tubin the first idea to go look up. Absolutely. And before I ever got on the case, Shapiro had this interview with Tubin and gave him the idea. And he was very proud of that, that, he, that this theory that this race is He thought he was spinning out. the story. Yeah, thought he was spinning the story. He, w he was very proud of his ability to spin stories. And perhaps the thing that I, I found most offensive was the fact that one day in the lockup, he was taping, surreptitiously taping our conversations. And I understand others may have done that. Can you imagine that? In order to write a book. To write a book. These, and then trying to represent the client. People are, are working on their book, taping conversations during that. It's pretty frightening. Uh, you know, I don't know where the idea of advocacy comes in and wh where these lawyers got so lost along the way. And, and I, I really found that offensive. Chris Darden, come back to Shapiro in a minute. Chris Darden was here, talked about the what happened to the relationship between the two of you. Said, among other things, you ran that courtroom. Yeah. That Cochran had everybody under his spell. And yeah. you were, you know, including the judge. That's preposterous. We, we, you know, we, we heard some of those comments. We went back and looked at the rulings. Judge Ito ruled for the prosecution more than 70% of the time. I have a lot of respect for Judge Ito, but keep in mind, this is the judge who allowed a dream in. What kind of a dream was it? Even he admitted that was wrong. He took 60-some-plus incidents regarding the permit and gave us two. One of you couldn't hear. But what this about the what about the civil judge who I think, and again, I, I plead not following this as closely because sure. I do other things sure. other than cover this trial, I mean, other than pay attention to this trial. Has the civil judge allow, said to attorneys, we will not allow evidence of police misconduct unless you have the evidence to back it up. You can't. Yes, yeah, so there's an indication. And that's a very that. dramatic difference. So the central point you hung your defense on, this civil suit will not hear that kind of testimony. Well, not exactly. Uh, first of all, the lawyer, <laughs> Bob Baker, is an yeah. excellent lawyer. What he said, you've got to have some Simpson food. lawyer? Yeah, Bob right. Baker. He's, he's an excellent civil lawyer. Watch him. Remember that name. He's the best lawyer in that courtroom now. Uh, he and Bob Lazer. And you're going to see and hear more about him. Um, what, what he said is essentially you've got to produce some hard evidence of a police conspiracy or whatever. Right. Now, we, you and I have been talking already. Uh, it's very hard. And the police officers aren't going to come forward. The police officers didn't come forward on Furman. We found that tape through the screenwriter. It's very difficult. So the judge cannot stop, however, the fact that you bring up circumstantial evidence of certain things that happened, I think. And so uh, this judge has taken a, a tougher view. One of the real problems of it. It would have made your case much more difficult if you had this kind of ruling in your criminal case. Well, Perhaps so, but look, uh, we, we wanted Perhaps to go into... Yeah, you know, but, no, well, let me tell you what uh, Judge Eno curtailed us from talking about it being a possible drug killing. They said, we, you can't bring that up. I mean, we were curtailed well, isn't that from the right beginning. ruling in a case? In a sense. I think in but a, can, a, can a criminal defense attorney bring up any possible scenario? No, no, that, no but if unless you have, you have direct evidence that it's you need witnesses. feasible. You need witnesses. witnesses, and we thought we had witnesses, and they would not allow us to call them. And I think you're going to find, so the bottom line right. is this, by the time this case goes to trial, in the civil case, I think you're going to find that the defense will have... They can produce enough witnesses to indicate and be able to argue that there was, this evidence was tampered with. There are certain items that you cannot otherwise explain. There's going to be, no matter what this judge rules, it's going to be mainly the point, blood evidence is going to be going to make your case. Five, right, the CCs of missing blood. Yeah. They're but not going to be able to explain. But that, here's what a lot of people ask, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm being tough on this thing because I don't really sure, know that sure. much about it. A lot of people say it's one thing that there's missing blood, it's another thing to show what happened to it, and it was tampered. Oh, absolutely, but they're two very different propositions. That's true, but look, Charlie, if you have, if you find EDTA, this right. substance, this, this preservative substance on the back gate or on the sock, supposedly, in the bedroom, how'd that get there? I mean, you, you've got to have an explanation for that. Why is the blood on the socks in the bedroom? First of all, the socks aren't there at 413 per video right. from Willie Ford, but they're there uh, 20 minutes later. Uh, how does EDTA get on those socks? Why is the blood there put there by compression? Why does the blood go from side one to side two to side three if there's a leg in it? There are, there are things in this case that any rational person, if you understand the facts, will never be able to explain. But as a former prosecutor, yes. aren't there always things you can't explain in a criminal case because of what different people see and what happens to evidence always? Not this overwhelming. If the socks are key, and Marcia Clark says they're key to showing the blood trail, why aren't the socks there when there's a video at the foot of the bed taken at 413 and they're there at 440? There's some things you just can't explain. Where is this missing blood? You can't explain. Why do the, why do the photographs of the back fence 
taken around Janu June, yeah. uh, June 12th or 13th. They don't show any marks but, back there. But the fact that Vanetta kept that vial of blood. Yes, and does he also not, took two but, others, too. But does not prove that he tampered with it, does, does it? it? doesn't prove The fact that he kept it and didn't immediately go do something with it does not prove that he had criminal intent. But it gives him the opportunity. You see, you start... So all you got to do is show opportunity to create doubt. And then you then... Right? You, like, yes, exactly. What, and that's more what than it's that. about. No, more than that. Create doubt and you're well, on your way. Well, the more than that. You have to have the opportunity, first of all. If that had not taken the blood, then you might be hard-pressed to do it. But you have the blood that has EDT in it. And then, of course, now you find... That's two things you Okay, that's two things. You have the blood that has EDTA in right. that blood. And now you find EDTA on several of the items. Well... I mean, you know, does it take a rocket scientist to figure that, that, that that is certainly a reasonable hypothesis for what happened? And you couple that you with the You know what it takes? It takes a jury, a jury, uh, that, because of their life experience, might find that reasonable. That's right. We talk about that's what, what it, is reasonable. That's and, what And you hit it upon takes. it better than almost anyone else. It is about the history of this department. If you live in Los Angeles... You understand. This may not be how it is in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, maybe they didn't have Chief Parker there. If you grew up in L.A., and there's a oral tradition that's passed down many times through women in the community, prosecutors didn't understand this. You don't have to tell anybody about that. Did any part of Johnny Cochran say, because of all this history that I outlined in the first 15 minutes of this conversation, say... I want to win this case because of O.J. Simpson, I believe is innocent, but also I want to put it to the L.A. Police Department in a case where they believe and think they've got their man, and I want to put him, take their measure in the most highly publicized suit in the history of American jurisprudence. No. I'm, not it, it, not no. anything to say, I'm going to show you, get you, prove to you no. that this no, I, no I, longer will happen in Los Angeles because I'm going to show what... No, I believed he was innocent, the first part. I, 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 I believed he was innocent. I believe that. But let me tell you why I, that wasn't so. If that were so, if I, because if you think about it logically, I was the one who should have cross-examined Furman. Bob Shapiro asked me to do it. Yeah, but you didn't want to do that because... But I didn't want to do it because it escalated the racial tension, and I opted in. Well, I I either that or you I didn't have the stomach it. for it. <laughs> I've had a whole career. I've I know, but, I mean, but this guy, you so... What? No, I'm the one who went to North Carolina. I'm the one who got the tapes. I have the stomach for it. That's what I have done. But you didn't do it. Why? I didn't do it because I didn't want to escalate the racial tensions. I thought that if you saw this black lawyer out there asking this white police officer these questions, everybody expected that. It would certainly play into racial fears. And I live in Los Angeles. Twice in my career as a lawyer, I've seen my city go up in smoke. And I didn't want to do it, and I picked who I picked. If I was really. Johnny Cochran, <laughs> if I was that good, yeah. <laughs> I would have had a hard time when I came to the part that was later used, in a sense, to indict Johnny Cochran about comparing the LAPD, LAPD and Hitler because of what you knew. Not the question of what was in your heart, but the fact that, as smart as you are, the potential for the feelings it would create. Because the Holocaust to all of society, and especially Jews in the world, there's never been anything or will ever be anything so evil. You know, I'm not going to get into comparing um, tragedies. No, I'm not going to talk about slavery. But that was the way it was perceived. Yeah, and understand that. Let me tell you, of all the things that happened during my closing argument, I would not use that phrase or that analogy. But let me tell you a little bit about that. You, you would not use it on second no, trial? I would not. I would not. I would not use it for the, because I think it was misunderstood. Right. That came from a Jewish lawyer who came directly, who lost much of his family in Auschwitz, Charles Linder, Chuck Linder. He writes also for the LA Times. That was an analogy that he proposed. The reason was we knew that Furman was a mem Nazi memorabilia collecting person and very possibly a person who had Nazi ties. That's what everybody said who'd been in this room and knew this. The prosecutors also knew that. It seemed like an apt description. All I was trying to say, and I said Furman didn't have the power of a Hitler who was a scourge. I didn't minimize the show of the Holocaust at all. What I was trying to say was that Sir Edmund Burke said it better. All that's required. For evil to triumph. triumph is for good men to remain silent. That's what I was trying to say. Now, I might have said that better and easier. That would have been a much the better way to put it. Was, people were so emotional. That got, so I would not do that again. But that's what I was trying to say. I have been to Israel. I have been to Yad Vashem. I understand about the Holocaust. I'm an African-American. I know about deaths of 
in the civil rights movement, black Americans had no better friends than Jewish Americans. That's right. And, 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 I, and, I, feel, and I have no better friends than, than Jewish Americans now. And so I would not have done that, but I think it was misunderstood. I really do, John. Anything else you wouldn't have done in that trial? Well, I think there's regrets. I think that's probably the main major regret. I think the other things, you know, um, and as I said, I, I don't think that I thought it was an appropriate analogy coming from a Jewish uh, lawyer, but because of the misunderstanding, it just wasn't, it would, I wouldn't do that again. The other things, I was an advocate. It wasn't about trying to take the popular course, Charlie. It was about trying to represent the client. Did it make any difference to you whether Simpson did it or not? Yes, it did, and it would. Because let me tell you why. Uh, I would never suborn perjury. I would not uh, put I understand. You can't do that. You, you can't do that. Yeah, suborn so, perjury. Yeah. But, but so far, you, Simpson could say, look, I didn't do it. And you take his word for it. Yeah, I try, you try to take your clients at their word. But, but they, you didn't put him on the trial, so you're not suborning perjury. Right, but I mean, you would. But if you tried to introduce evidence of the timeline, if you, if you, if he said, "Look, I did this," you wouldn't then call any witnesses to try and show they didn't do it. You couldn't do that, you know. You wouldn't. But in this case, he didn't testify, as you as you're aware. But he always maintained he didn't do it. He uh -huh. never, he never deviated from that with any of us. It, I understand that, and everybody I've talked to, Barishek's been on the show for yes. an hour as well, Nobody and he said it. the same thing. He said, "I believed in the guy." Yeah. And it's then they say, "Well, why do you believe in him?" And said, so, "I mean, it, it, Omen." So why do you believe in the guy? Said, well, he just the way he was suggested to me that it's true. How can you, you know, to say ask you these questions suggested that you believe that Simpson lied to you and believe that he did it and all that? But how can you know that somebody didn't do it because of the way they look and the way they talk? No, you can't. You can't know that. But you, you, what you do is you try to, you take what and because he take his word for it. Yeah, you, you take their word for it. But also, but I would argue that, that anybody would kill would lie. Well. They may be true, but you also look at it from the standpoint of what this person tells you, and if it checks out, if he says to you certain things and they check out, you know. Did it, you it have to know for yourself it. then? Did you have to go check it out and know for yourself before you would say yes? No, from the standpoint, I knew O.J. Simpson from the very beginning. He said so he was because innocent. I knew so O.J. Simpson, I said I'll do it. I'll take your word for it. I'm not going to go check it out. Whereas with most people, you would want to check it out. Well, no, no, I wouldn't. Uh, most you don't really have the luxury of going out to. You're not like the prosecutor. You don't uh, go out and check everything out. Now, somewhere along the way, in the course of the case, you may change your mind. I think this guy's not telling the truth. But did I you tell ever you. have a moment like that in what you said? No, no, you didn't. I did not. His memory is faulty here in terms of what he said because it's not in for the public record. Well, it's not know, for the jury. Well, and what you say, we've got a contradiction here. How do we figure out how to do something about this contradiction? Was, he would always be able to explain things. And you know, the thing, one of the things that really helped us a lot was the interview we had with the police, those 33 minutes on tape yeah. uh, at the very beginning. And, you know, that, that said a lot because this, he had had, what, one or two hours of sleep. Right. He came back, talked to these detectives. His lawyer said, you shouldn't do this. He said, look, I want to talk. Howard Weitzman? Yeah, Howard Weitzman and, and Skip Tapp. They left and left him alone with these officers. He was in the car riding with them downtown. Now, why would they do that? <laughs> because apparently, according to, the, to Howard Weitzman and the others, the Van Adder and Lang said, if you insist on being here, we won't interview your client. Someone said, look, I have nothing I, I want to talk with him. Now, now I mean, if, <laughs> promise me, if I'm ever brought, I hire you and I'm brought before the police, Yes. You know, you and the police officer lawyer. said, I, did I listen to you and I don't go talk to the police? I mean, that's stupid. It's hey, it's stupid. Wise, it's not the wisest thing. I mean, that was lawyer. stupid by Whiteman's point, too. Well, to well, allow your client and your friend, in this case, I guess. Well, you know, I, 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 always, felt, I always felt that if your client insists on doing it, you either one of two things, you, you drag him out of there or you say, or you I'm drag yourself sure. out of the case. That's it. One or the other. Say, I'm leaving the case. That's exactly Is right. that why Weitzman left or did he leave the case for no, some other reason? No, as you he, know, the speculation in Los Angeles. No, I mean, at that point, he's still on the case. No, right. I mean, I mean, leave right at that moment. You're right. So you say, if lawyer, you do this, you got another lawyer. That's right. I, you That's know, exactly because correct. you are hurting yourself, and I'm That's not going right. to be part of you, exactly. you know, engaging in suicide. That's here. exactly correct. There are two other books I want to talk to you about. One is Vincent Bullios. He says, it was a winnable case for the prosecution, and they blew it. I've not read his book. I know Vincent. Nor have I, to be honest with you. Vincent <laughs> has not tried a case in over 20 years. From what, I, from the, what it seems to me is like a, a, it's like a press release for Vincent Bugliosi. I mean, how easy? He never even came to court. He says he didn't watch the case. For a guy to stand I what else he says, though, which I, did, I didn't know he says this, and I haven't read this book either. I haven't read any of these books. Except this one. The, he says, <laughs> he's, well, you know, you, this is a story of you, and this is more than a story of the trial. A, this is not okay. a And that's why I went through it the way I did, to say who is Johnny Cochran before we figure out where, where, where sure. how does he come yeah. to be here before that's we examine right. what he did once he was there. Sure. Bugliosi yeah. seems to say that the LAPD, just to question him for 45 minutes, that was stupid. 
You know, I've talked to other people who, in law enforcement, say, if I'd had that opportunity, he would have been there a lot longer than 45 minutes. And maybe six hours would have been better. You know what, though, Charlie? All of these things... If you were a prosecutor and you'd had an opportunity to do that, you would have been thrilled by that opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't you? you certainly would be. I six mean, hours? I mean, to go at a guy and you can let him go for 45 minutes if, in fact, there's some reason to believe he might have done it. He's in there without... Exactly. He's in there without a lawyer, even. I mean, understand that. How now, stupid is that? Well, the, these two detectives have been there... So 20, maybe these guys are not... 27 years yeah. apiece, basically. And if they did... So, but you'll see, here's what he does. And this is the sad part. He only toots his own horn. He's saying, it's easy when you're standing on the sideline to say, I could have done this, could have, would have, should have. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's just make-believe in his own mind. He had tried a case in 20 years. He's an author, and he needs to stay there and stop speculating about real lawyers who are actually trying cases, those of us who are out here. We would have been glad to have Vincent Bugliosi. Time has passed. You could have I. taken Bugliosi on this case. It would have been no contest. Marsha Clark is a tough lawyer. She's been trying cases. She's real. She's out there. Not what you thought about what he did 20 years ago. The Manson case, and I'm not taking anything away from that case, but, yeah. I mean, um, most people could have won the Manson case. You have a defendant who yeah, has a swastika right. on his right. forehead, right. threatens to kill the jury. I mean, that wasn't exactly... And all kinds of what happens yeah, everywhere. That was not a tough case to right. win. So, he, you know, that he should stop riding that horse and stay out of this. He's not one who really should be commenting. I mean, the other participants, I can understand them at least writing. He wasn't... He didn't watch the trial or whatever. He just comes to tell us he could win. It was an outrage otherwise. And you and say you would have loved to have had him. We would have loved to have had him try this case. We would have loved it. And, and to a person, we would have. Because emotionally, we would have loved to have now, I've seen Vincent. I've been on a program with him. I've seen his reaction to various things, and we would have loved it. And there's no question about that. So I don't, I don't put much stock. I mean, that's just spec. What he's talking about is speculation. He wasn't even there. But he, what he tries to do is he turns it around, though, and criticizes everybody. And what he does in that process is builds himself up. He says, if I'd been there, I, unlike Darden, who he says was incompetent, and Clark, and yeah. the officers, he would have done everything right. Now, that's real easy to talk well, about. Tubin says the prosecution was incompetent, too. Now, he was well, there. Tubin, and Tubin, he also is a lawyer. Tubin was there, and he's a lawyer. And I was going to say something about Jeffrey Tubin. Jeffrey Tubin, though, you know, he, he's a, you know, he's an engaging young man, and, and he and I talked during the trial. But I'll tell you something interesting about him. He would all, he was very biased, and he'll admit it. He made a decision early on that he thought O.J. Simpson was guilty, and it colored everything he did. Here's a quick example. One day he was a, uh, on the Today Show in the morning, and he came on the air and told uh, the national television audience today the prosecution is going to show that a photograph of a of the glove of Simpson taken when, as an announcer has a defect in it, and that defect will match the glove in court. And I saw him later that day. I said, Jeffrey, why do you do things like that? Did you just make that up? Well, somebody told me that. That's typical of the kind of things that he would do. Where he had, I don't know if anybody told him that or not, but there was absolutely no truth in that. And he had an obligation to, to look out these things. I mean, he should have called me up and asked me, did you ever tell anybody that you thought something should be? He never did that. And we know each other. And he didn't do that. So if you're just looking for some source or somebody to tell you something, that's one thing. And, you know, and he is a talented fellow. But he was just dead wrong on a number of issues. Simpson didn't know about the verdict the night before. That's uh, the other point. He makes it some, he somebody in the that? jail and staff he didn't know. told him. These because guys, they these... had a friend who had a friend. And one, uh, the, one of the, I guess, alternative jurors, jurors, that's the story, one of the alternate jurors told somebody who told somebody. Yeah, and that, that wasn't true. And somebody asked for Simpson's autograph, which is preposterous. No. Yeah, because we know you can out of here tomorrow, so we want to get yeah. the autograph now. No. Not happen. True. Simpson did not know. No, he did not know. When he did, stood up but there, you also he say Shapiro turned to Simpson and said, be ready for this, they're going to convict you. Absolutely. When, when Judge Ito looked down uh, toward in the center of the courtroom after he saw the verdict, he had this look on his face. Shapiro leaned over and said, it's going to be bad news. You're going to get convicted. And I said, Bob, you knock it off. Shut up. Uh, I said, you knock it off. He called Dershowitz the night before and said, get the appeal ready. That was the same night, however, he'd gone out and had this interview with Barbara Walters, too. So he had a different theory. His theory was he would come in, forget he had amnesia, amnesia, and blame us for the race car, claim if he'd been in charge, it would have worked out fine. We lost the case. None of that worked for him. Race card from the bottom of the deck. deck. Yeah, and you can imagine that he's the one who brought it up. Uh, uh, okay, but before that, you were sitting watching ABC with Barbara Walters and Shapiro yeah, that I night. I, I didn't see that either. I you heard, heard about it. I didn't you see heard it. about it. Yeah, and would you say, it. would you think, would you, would you want to pick up the phone and call him? And did you? No, I never. You didn't call him. You didn't bring no. it up with him. You never spoke no, to him since. I've spoken to him since because I haven't seen him since October third. So what happens if he calls you up and says, Johnny, let's have lunch and figure out what? Which separates us. Mm, I would do that. You would? I would do that because of the fact that, you know, we had a relationship in this case. And he's done some things that I would love to hear his explanation for. He, I, I think he could not explain them. Like what? The shifting sands, the, 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 the you know, um, giving this interview. 
turning on his teammates. I mean, how could you do that? How could you? He spent the last three months or so working on his book, uh, taping our conversation, going down and seeing O.J. Simpson. When I told O.J. Simpson about the tape recording, he said, I'm not surprised. He said, because he came down to see me at the jail and took his tape recorder out and said, tell me your innermost thoughts. And, you know, Simpson. It's not told, the way you get, get somebody lost, to tell right? animal's yes, thoughts anyway. Yes, yes, yes <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, F. Lee Bailey. Um, a fine lawyer, and I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, he did an excellent job on Furman especially. That was, I thought, the high point of his trial. And he got, he got, um, he never got the plot that he deserved, but his cross-examination was so excellent that when we found those tapes, it fit right with the ten years. Frame. So he used ten years. He didn't know about the tape. No, did not yeah. know. We did not know about those tapes at all. A bad time for you is when you got two of your guys duking it out in public. It was in public. Terrible. It was. Some people say if you talk to Barishek and Jerry Ullman, they said that perhaps the greatest achievement we had was keeping the team together, where two members don't even talk. They didn't want to ride in the same car together. And they had been close, where uh, Lee Bailey was uh, Shapiro's sure. uh, son's uh, godfather. Well, not only that, Shapiro had defended Bailey, hadn't he? Sure, he had defended him, and they were very close. They were on each other's letterhead. Mm -hmm. And so it was a tough. So we, we managed through that mm -hmm. also, because it's about the client, not our personal egos or our personal problems. This is the, whenever you interview a criminal defense lawyer and somebody watches the interview, they come to you and say, I just want to know one thing. <laughs> very good. <laughs> what is it? Tell me what you think it is. Um, would you defend someone if you thought he was exactly. guilty? That's what they always say. Yeah, well, I know that. That's why I know that. Yeah. Uh, and it depends. If a client comes to me and says, I'm guilty, uh, will you defend me? I said, well, do you want me to go down and, and work this case out, enter into some kind of a uh, plea bargain? Uh, then fine, I can do that. Uh, if the client says, no, 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 I want you to give me a full out all defense and cross-examine all the witnesses. I probably wouldn't take it, but certainly you would be ethically and morally okay if you did it as long as you, the guy says you did it, and as long as you didn't try to bring in witnesses when you knew they would be lying. You could cross-examine the witnesses, clearly, but uh, so it would be a tougher situation. The interesting part of that is hardly any client ever, ever tells any lawyer that unless he wants to plead guilty. That's like they say in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody here, buddy, is innocent. It's right. been framed. Right. Every one of them. Yes. Uh, nobody, not few of them there who say, yeah, they, they, you know, there are boy, some, I, I belong, some who are few. I belong to be here. And, right. you know. um, what happens now, first of all, if something happens and somehow, for some reason, some piece of evidence turns up or O.J. Simpson says, I can't take it, I'm, you know. In fact, I have, notwithstanding Johnny Cochran, notwithstanding... Barry Sheck and notwithstanding Peter Newfield and notwithstanding all those people who fought valiantly to save my life. Life. Yes. I lied to him. We'd be terribly, I, I, I can speak for myself and I know Barry would too, we'd be terribly disappointed. We did our jobs based upon everything that we knew at the time, all the evidence and whatever, based upon relying on our client. Uh, I don't think this would ever happen, but we'd be very disappointed yeah. if it did. And you have no reason in your mind, nothing's ever caused you to say. You know? Not at all. Lawrence Schiller, you know him? Uh, yes, I know Lawrence Schiller. He's got a book, yes. too. Yes, apparently so. That's the Kardashian. Yeah, that's Schiller's right. That's the Kardashian. Well, I mean, there's some other things in there. He seems to believe. How do all these guys come to these conclusions? Tubin seems to believe. Nick uh, Dunn seems to believe. How do all these people sit around and watch this trial in the courtroom? Is it because their experience was different from the jurors? Is that the reason so many reporters they, seem to cover this trial and believe this guy? Believe? That, that is guilty. Okay. You, you, it, Tubin it, believes it. Nick it, Dunn believes it. Well, let's take the first Schiller two. Schiller knows Simpson. Yeah. I don't know what... I haven't read his yeah. book either, but... Uh, let, let me take the first two. Larry Schiller, I have not read his book. I, mean, hard. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but the first two. Uh, Dominic Dunn said at the very beginning... See, that I have respect, more respect for Dominic Dunn than some others. Because he said he lost a child. He did. He, done he says, right. I, can't, I can't be fair, and I think this guy's guilty. And I, yeah. Up front, he said that. So all of his, everything he did was colored by that, but he at least had enough integrity to say that. Tubin is a lawyer and should have known better. Uh, so I don't, I don't forgive him as easily for doing that. Larry Schiller, I don't know. But Larry Schiller wrote the first book, that bestseller, I Want to Tell You, with O.J. Simpson. And had his confidence and made money off O.J. Simpson. Now, I don't know until somebody tells me otherwise that he says O.J. Simpson. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know I don't what he know says that. either, but I'd certainly like I'd be book. really surprised if that happened. Yeah, but he's got yeah. Kardashian and, you know. Yeah, with this, this, this tease that yeah. you've seen. All right, let me ask you, how has this changed your life? 
Oh, it's it's because I have a lot less privacy when yeah. when you come into a building like Did this. You write a people... book for four what, four and a half million for this thing. Well, I can't talk about the amount, oh. but, but it's uh, but uh, Charlie, very good, Charlie. It was well, wait, wait, wait a minute, but but you got more than anybody else. You take some pride in that, don't you? Well, you, you know, got more I, than Martha. You got more than Chris Darn. I, I take pride in that book, and I really do now. And it's not just a Simpson book. So uh, fortunately, well, I, I pointed that out. Three times. And you've been really good about that. But yeah, I take some pride in, in the fact that uh, we have this book that I got a chance to write it, and I hope yeah. that it, it it talks about uh, the justice system. I want to come to that in just a moment in terms of the legacy of all this. Sure. Are you happy about Chris Darn's success? I am. I am happy for his success. And, and, you know, I wish him well. I said in the book, I wish him well, but I also wish him some wisdom. This idea of t attacking the jury, going around crying, acting like a whining and crying, that's not professional. And you got to stop it. One of the best things I did for Chris Darden, I took him aside as a, as a person that I cared about, and I said, don't you take Furman. He was going to take him as a witness. It's the best advice he got during that trial. Now, why should Chris Darden trust you? He, he didn't take him. When you're the lead defense attorney. Because I looked him in the eye and I told him, I said, don't you take this guy, this guy's a bad guy. You know, what, did he say to you, what did he say to you about Marsha Clark? Oh, he said, okay, he said, you well, know, like, 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 he said things like, uh, leave my woman alone. And he'd get, get all upset about it, you know, as though that was his woman. I said, what are you talking about, your woman? What do you mean by that? I presume he was jesting about it. But, uh, you know, you never know. You never know, do you? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think that this showed the ugly, ugly, ugly face of racism in the reaction to this trial. African Americans split from Caucasian Americans on this. And it says race remains the American dilemma. It does. I think, I think race is the American dilemma. And I think the problem with it is the cure proposed is one of denial by so many Americans. Denial will not cure it. We've got to... Denial that, that a jury... No, had an opportunity to hear from denial. No, no. Denial about the issue of race. People don't want to talk about race in this country. It's a hard subject. It's a taboo. Don't ask, don't tell. That's why we don't solve it. You don't put it on the table. We need to get it out front and talk about the things that, that, that separate us. There are far more things, Charlie, that unite us than those that separate us. I agree. That's what I believe. I feel have like you talked about. to the president about this? President on the Clinton? phone, President Clinton. No, I have not, and I, I would love to, uh, because I think we need moral leadership at the highest level in this regard. So the only thing he's going to let me tell you, W.E.B. Du Bois said at the beginning, in 1903. This is what you quote in the last page right, as well. Yes, among things, yes. When I talk about the Tunis aspect, right. that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. Right. He was absolutely right. The only problem is going to be the problem of the 21st century, unless somebody steps up and says, wait a minute, the road traveled by blacks and whites together has brought us closer in a union, and somebody has to bring us together. Yeah. This is our country, and we love it, all of us. But knowing that, it must bother you a little bit that when they think of Johnny, Car Johnny, Johnny Cochran's defense of O.J. Simpson, they say he played the race card. He used race. Yes, in a it, it, it bothers me because that's wrong, as I hope we've demonstrated tonight. That the, not only is it wrong, I never brought it up. I dealt with the witnesses, and I dealt with credibility in the history of the LAPD. I didn't use race any more than I used any other case. If I had not gone after this particular witness, Furman, it would have been malpractice. It's just that simple. Uh -oh. Ask any lawyer. What do you think about what Furman is saying now? You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm sorry. That would be fine if he didn't turn right around and then try to blame the jury, saying that they made him a scapegoat. He's no scapegoat. He's no, he said, he what he, no, no, that's not what he said. What he said is they made, he made it easy for them to scapegoat him or whatever. No, he said, he said, the fact that I was there as a liar made it easier for them to convict Simpson. Uh, to, to, uh, to acquit Simpson. Right. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Quit, no, I, I, I think, I think it, 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 with the apology, we can accept. But he's in massive denial as to who he is and what this jury did. The jury didn't like him from the beginning, and he had nothing to do with it. Nobody was interested in him being a scapegoat. He should just come in there and told the truth. That's what we're talking about. What kind of message does it send? A, pl a police officer gets on the stand and lies in a first-degree murder case, and he gets a $200 fine, gets to go home to Idaho. What would have been appropriate from Johnny Cochran? Some time in custody. Absolutely. What custody? Any other, what any other person would have gotten under the circumstances. What kind of message do you send to police officers? Is it okay to lie and get a $200 fine? Well, give me a nice sentence that you think would be appropriate. Well, I mean, the sentence carries up to three years. I'd leave that to the judge, but I think he should have gone to prison. Should have gone so to I'd prison for perjury. For perjury in a murder case like this? Absolutely. He said himself, I'm the key witness in the trial of the century. If I go down, the glove goes out, the case goes bye-bye, and he should have gone bye-bye for lying. What about you accuse police officers of lying too? Should they go to prison? 
Well, he was a police officer. No others. You, you accused well, no, Van I mean, Atta of well, lying. Well, if they, you know, no, I think in that situation, Van Atta's situation, we, we were talking about the Edo found he had a reckless disregard for the truth. We were using it then. I think in a situation like that, I don't think he told well, us you're the truth. Aren't you accusing him of lying when you say something happened to the vial and, and that they did something well, with well, it? I mean, he's the one that had custody of it. If you're saying that something was done to it, you're saying well, he did it, aren't well, you? What I really said about Van Atta was the fact that I couldn't explain why he had this blood, and I thought that certainly opened us up to all kinds of possibilities. But I also said the Fiato brothers impeached him because he told them that he went over there because right. the husband's always the suspect now. Right. right. That impeachment or not. You know, there's a difference between impeachment and right. saying I've right. never used this N-word in 10 years. That's the difference. Johnny L. Cochran, proud son of Johnny L. Cochran Sr., who tonight at the Plaza Hotel yes. at a book party will be there with his son. That's great. Author, defense attorney, American. Uh, Journey to Justice is book. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Charlie. My pleasure. Pleasure. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow night.